Good evening. I shall be presenting on Horace's Ars Poetica. Now, Ars Poetica is one of the three foundational texts of Western literary critical thought. The first of which is obviously Aristotle's Poetics, followed by Ars Poetica, and then the third is Longinus on the Sublime. So, the objective of this class would be to sort of situate Horace within the canon of Western literary critical thought pertaining to Ars Poetica and uh, see the ways in which it has influenced writers and thinkers over time. The contents of the presentations are as follows. I'll be providing some short notes on the author and his background, following which I shall be focusing on form, genre and the poet's approach to poetry uh, and Horace's approach to poetry. Following which I will be providing some critique of the work and yeah, that's it. Let's get started. So Horace was born Quintus Horatius Flaccus in Venusia, Italy in 65 BC and enrolled in Plato's Academy at the age of 19. He was the leading Roman poet during the era of Augustus. I will be speaking more on this later. He wrote satires, odes and epistles mostly and passed away uh, at in 8 BC. Uh, his notable works include satires 1 and 2, epodes, odes 1 to 4, epistles 1 and 2, Carmen Seculaire, and Ars Poetica. Background. So, Ars Poetica was authored in 19 BC and at the time of it being authored, the dominant literary or philosophical attitudes were those of Stoicism, Epicureanism and Skepticism. Uh, while Stoicism and Skepticism had strands of seriousness in them, Epicureanism was mostly concerned with the pursuit of pleasure. And all three schools of thought were diverse and disparate, of, um, somewhat disparate and uh, they accepted the Greek theory of imitation, mimesis while striving for originality in the Roman context. So Horace's place in the literary tradition seems to be a combination of these different strands and uh, he seems to be occupying a sort of medium between Virgil's Stoicism and Ovid's Cynicism. Obviously, the works being referenced here are Virgil's Aeneid and Ovid's Metamorphosis. Poet, uh, the poem itself is written in um, dactylic hexameter and it is uh, it was originally written as a letter uh, to the wealthy Bisson family and uh, he, has, uh, he has also written other such letters during the course of his career. Uh, some of them are Epistle to Florus as well as Epistle to Augustus. Um, it is the first poem about poetics and not only does it have literary critical uh, importance but it is also an important work of rhetorical theory. Um, it was translated into English by Ben Johnson and then later Lord Byron and inspired a plethora of writers such as medieval writer Geoffrey de Vinsoff, the Renaissance writer Pierre de Ronsard, the neoclassical poets Nicholas Boileau Despro and Alexander Pope, the romantic poet Lord Byron and 20th century poets such as Wallace Stevens. Coming to form, uh, like I mentioned earlier, the letter and the poem is written in epistolary format and couplets with some rhyme and slant rhyme and uh, it is, there are said to be strands of modernism within the poem and it is fairly casual in tone. Uh, we can see that the author is beseeching his audience to follow certain principles that he draws from experience rather than from texts. And in some ways, it is highly prescriptive, although not as technical as the works of Plato or Aristotle. And we can call it a manifesto of sorts. Uh, there is strong emphasis on decorum and uh, the poet insists that there should be a proper relationship not only between form and content, but also expression and thought, style and subject matter, and diction and character, because these are all in, like integral to the structure of a poem, and they are all uh, intimately connected. So, what Horace adv advocates is poetic unity, and lays constant emphasis on the uh, on the parts of a poem being properly arranged and connected. Uh, approach. His, uh, again, comparing Horace to his uh, predecessor, such as Aristotle, we see that his work is not, his tone is not as, though prescriptive is not as technical as that of Aristotle, 
However, we do realize that uh, comparing Horace with Longinus uh, on the sublime, we see that it is not as passionate as what Longinus describes either. So, while Longinus spoke often and at length about the concept of uh, the the quality of transport, the ability of a work of art of literature to transport the reader out of their body to inspire in them feeling, feelings of extreme sublimity. Uh, that is not as much of a focus here. One thing that is the Torres is very particular about is his deep knowledge and awareness of genre and the distinctions between different genres. So he does follow, he does accept that there is a hierarchy of genres and he adheres to them loosely. So there are the high genres such as epic, tragedy and occasionally history. And then there are low genres which are considered more base forms of entertainment. However, the status of lyric is sort of ambiguous. It is seen as attractive but it is again not accorded uh, much intellectual importance. So what Horace emphasizes upon is knowledge of generic rules. Uh, and uh, such as diction, meter and subject and uh, they sh which should align with the genre being treated. Uh, the decorum and propriety like mentioned as I mentioned earlier are also very important. Approach to poetry. Unlike Plato and Aristotle, uh, Horace's approach was more subjective and uh, more realistic. Um, there was a pragmatic strong strand of pragmatism in his advocacy on poetry and that I will speak about later. He spoke of the element of subjectivity in art and uh, he often said that the writer's uh, selection of subject should be in tandem with his own capability. So the writer should be aware of what he is capable of producing, that he should be aware of the limits of his ability to create art. Although. Horace did compare uh, poetry to painting. He also brought about certain new ways of looking at poetry and one of them was this. I'm going to quote him now. When you are writing, choose a subject that matches your powers and test again and again what weight your shoulders will take and what they won't take. Like he reiterates this point a few times that uh, an author or a poet should be aware of what they are capable of writing and what uh, what are the so-called limits of what they are capable of producing um, and there again he emphasizes quite a lot on the ability of the audience to guide literature in some ways it can be this can be seen as an anticipation of reader response criticism and uh, and he often says that the it is the audience that is the ultimate decider, the ultimate arbiter when it comes to judging the quality of a piece of poetry. Um, again, like as the debate over the debate between the debate on the tussle between effort and genius, technique and genius, arts and ingenium respectively is present here as well uh, and again is extended in Longinus. But here the crux of the argument is that Effort should ideally take precedence over genius, um, but also an abundance of one without any of the other is quite useless. So necessarily poetry should serve a moral and social function is what Horace believed. He rejected the Alexandrian attitude of art for art's sake alone and uh, there should be the moral and social function of poetry should extend to the spheres of life including society and religion. Um, however, this does not seem to be in line with Horace's otherwise contrarian attitude. So, and this was a notion that was quite commonplace at the time, a notion that we have seen in Plato's Republic, where he did say that poetry was useless and that poets should be rusticated from society. And uh, so, although this was a very commonplace notion, we might be able to see as to how it was ironic in Horace's case because it did not, given his, uh, given his tendency to postulate things that sort of deviated from the ordinary. Uh, 
the poet's work must be based on empirical knowledge again experience gathered from situations in life and uh, poetry should combine pleasure as well as didactic lessons so what should the poetry should not be for pleasure sake alone or serve a moral just a moral or a social purpose there should be a combination of these two things when it when it come for poetry to be considered ideal along with serving as a source of conventional wisdom and citing numerous examples to that end poetry should also promote civic virtues and want to inspire people to become better citizens the strand of pragmatism like i mentioned earlier is quite strong in horace's work and uh, like some critiques of him mention later uh, his strand of pragmatism is also directly tied up with his situation in life so horace uh, started his career at the start of his career horace opposed augustus but eventually came under the patronage of augustus so this for this he was subjected to a fair bit of criticism because people did view him as a turncoat but what horace maintains is that the role of wealth is of utmost importance in the production of literature and to this end poets should not be afraid of seeking monetary patronage so the financial success of a work cannot be seen as independent from the aesthetics of a work and for that a good poet does not shy away from seeking patronage because it is that patronage that enables him to not to focus solely on the creation of poetry um again when it comes to receiving and dealing with criticism uh, horace is of the opinion that a good poet does not shy away from constructive criticism uh, however what is very important here is that a poet a good poet is often very discerning about when and where to publish his work especially when because uh, if it does not meet a certain standard the poet has to live with the knowledge of his work being disseminated and him having no way to take it back um the fact that his work will enter the mainstream and enter consciousness of the public and he will not have any way to recall it is something that the poet should keep in mind to this end there is a quote it is permissible it will be permissible to destroy what you have not published the voice once sent forth cannot return coming to perfectionism in horace's uh, work horace insists upon this neither men nor gods nor booksellers can tolerate the existence of mediocre poets so here we see how perfectionism shouldn't only refer perfectionism shouldn't only be tied up with how the poet views his work it is also uh, how it is also something that is expected from by the audience by gods and by those who are looking to achieve monetary success by publishing so he is of the opinion that poets should practice a fair bit of discernment when it comes to creating their work as well as striving for perfection which should obviously be a very important aspect of creating poetry and um, to this end he is critical of how poetry can be practiced by anyone regardless of whether or not they have technical expertise in it what he keeps reiterating is that emphasis should be on learning the art of poetry as is reflected in the name of the work itself ars poetica instead of relying on unbridled inspiration here we can see how horace's thoughts on this topic uh, differs from longinus on the sublime while longinus speaks about uh, the sublime uh, causing causing readers and the audience to not be able to contain their emotions Uh, saying that the sublime um, stems from a place of uh, deep unbridled creativity the focus here again uh, is shifted to the technique behind producing such poetry and saying that merely creative inspiration is not enough again i shall be quoting two stanzas from the poem to show how exactly uh, horace envisions poetry to be in its ideal form 
the aim of the poet is to inform or delight or to combine together in what he says both pleasure and applicability to life in instructing be brief in what you say in order that your readers may grasp it quickly and retain it faithfully superfluous words simply spill out when the mind is already full fiction invented in order to please should remain close to reality here we can see how horace emphasizes on brevity for one as well as the te- need to remain close to reality the need to adhere to realism uh, these again are things that we take for granted now when it comes to viewing literary texts uh, things that are not seen as very out of the ordinary but at the time these were again important points that he thought poets should keep keep in mind he who combines the useful and the pleasing wins out by both instructing and delighting the reader that is the sort of book that will make money for the publisher cross the seas and extend the fame of the author so instructing and delighting the reader here we can see how the purpose of poetry is again like i mentioned earlier the didactic and the pleasure providing purposes of poetry are emphasized upon and they go hand in hand with each other one is not sacrificed for the other and uh, instructing and delighting these are both seen as equally important functions of poetry and again monetary gain is not seen as is not seen as a negative here art for art's sake is rejected as an axiom so the fact that a that a publisher can publish that a that a poet can write poetry that will be published by a publisher who views it as a lucrative undertaking is not seen as something that is morally corrupt it is seen it is accepted as only natural and is considered integral to how a poet is supposed to earn his living coming to critique of horace's work i shall be looking at a uh, ancient class ancient poets from the classical age and uh, as well as contemporary critics so juvenal the roman poet said this when horace cried rejoice his stomach was comfortably full now this again is tied up with horace's confusing allegiances and his his complete and utter disregard as to how people might view him changing allegiances that often obviously this is a reference to him seeking patronage under augustus in spite of the fact that he had begun his career in opposition to augustus john dryden the neoclassical poet says this that horace was a well-mannered court slave now horace's pragmatism is seen in different ways by different people um his belief that poetry should be created with an economic end in mind is is utterly is rejected by neoclassical uh, poets who are obviously coming from a place of following what classical poets had to say on the topic of poetry and that was that poetry should compulsorily serve a moral and social function esra pound the modernist poet has this to say he calls ars poetica myopic an imagine an unimaginative and he says this it would be worth 10 years of a man's life to translate catullus or ovid or perhaps sulpicia marlo golding gavin douglas were full of untempered admiration for their originals only such untempered admiration can produce the energy necessary to surrender and fusion it is difficult to imagine anyone wanting to feel like horace with sufficient force to produce the equivalent idiom Pound is of the opinion that Ars Poetica is undeserving of the place that it has been afforded in the Western literary canon, and that it is quite irrele- irrelevant in recent times. Now, this can be seen in light of Pound's emphasis on individualism, and which is directly at loggerheads, which is at loggerheads with uh, Ars Poetica's, uh, with the tenet. in our poetica that emphasizes on the social and moral function of poetry uh emphasizes on the need of poetry to serve civic to to appreciate civic virtues and appreciate and inspire civic virtues a question that is often brought up like i mentioned earlier is whether our poetica 
is a parody so like it is it is widely known that horace in his own beliefs was epicurean that his beliefs were geared towards the the pursuit of pleasure and pleasure alone and so for him to emphasize at great length upon the social and moral function of poetry seems to deviate from what he seems to preach in his other works to that end it sounds satirical and its tone sounds very pedantic like as if though the author is occupying a much higher moral ground than he actually does H.L. Tracy considers Ars Poetica to be a systematic argument. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, there is a conflict between individualistic expression and realistic conformity to pragmatic rules. We can try to understand Ezra Pound's critique of Ars Poetica in this light, because Ezra Pound was, of course, uh, heavily bent on individualistic expression. So, training self-discipline and a sense of reality help in reconciling the two, that of individual expression and realistic conformity. So what Horace does through this work of art, by correlating art as a whole with civilization as a whole, he helps us view art in a multifaceted way and helps, it, helps us see art not only in the ways that it might provide pleasure to readers, that it might prove to be aesthetically pleasing to readers, but all or inspire feelings of happiness in them or sadness as well but also in the ways that it might prove to be instrumental in the betterment of society as a whole.